Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Muse Arts Artist Holistic Wellness Series as part of the Ties to Community Programming. My name is Veronica, and I'll be the mediator of tonight's session. For those who are new, the Artist Holistic Wellness Series invites artists from all different artistic backgrounds to engage in discussion of all things music. This year, we are back to the healing powers of music, how music can be used as a medium of expression, and how it creates and empowers communities. We will explore holistic healing through music, community empowerment, emerging artists, music through generations, and the future of music. Before we continue, I would like to recognize the land we are situated upon. We recognize that we work and live on traditional indigenous territories. I am currently located on the traditional indigenous territory of the Hirawendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the territory of Mississaugas of the Credit. I wish to express gratitude to Mother Earth for the resources we are using, and I would like to honor all the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who have been living on this land since time immemorial. In tonight's session, we are exploring the theme of music through generations. Without further ado, I introduce today's special guest, Judith Cohen. Dr. Judith Cohen is a Canadian ethnomusicologist and singer. Judith is known for her work in Shepardic music and related traditions. She is the consultant for Spanish recordings of the legendary Alan uh, Lomex collection. Judith, Judith performs on and teaches recorders in both early music and folk traditions. She also teaches part-time at York University in Toronto. Judith, I introduce you to the space and allow you to introduce yourself further. Hi, thanks so much, Veronica, and thanks so much for the invitation. So as Veronica said, I'm Judith Cohen. I was born in Montreal and came to Toronto a long time ago. I've lived in Toronto now longer than Montreal. I came here 40 years ago. I am an ethnomusicologist, and basically that's music and culture, kind of anthropology of music, to put it one way. But I'm also a performer. So on the one hand, I'm an academic. I have a doctorate in ethnomusicology and a master's in medieval music. And on the other hand, I grew up in the folk revival years. And even when I perform in an academic context or a specialized context, I think of myself as a folk singer. And I play the instruments that you see behind me on my living room wall and several others. And you can also see that I have stacks of books everywhere. So that's where I'm coming from. Amazing. It is such an honor to have you on the session today. I want to start by asking you where it all started for you, either music wise. Um, was there any influence in your family or not? Can you take us through that? Well, yes and no. So uh, my father died very young. I was five years old. And I found out later, I knew he had a banjo and I still have the banjo, actually. And I have, because I was so young and he was sick before he died, I only have very vague memories of him playing the banjo, but I do have them. But it wasn't a big thing. It was a hobby. It was something that he would take out very rarely and play. And I found out much, much later, long after he passed away, that in fact, he'd had a swing band in his youth in Montreal and paid for his university education that way. But I didn't know that till it was far too late to even look up other living members of the band. Um, and my mother went to work. I mean, immediately she found a job and brought us up and supported us. So, I mean, everyone liked to sing, Every, you know, people like to sing, people have music at weddings and, and so on, but it wasn't a major thing. Although the fact that I had the banjo made me gravitate toward, you know, string instruments. I fooled around on the banjo. It was messed up. The string, the, you know, the strings of the skin needed to be replaced and so on. But I kind of messed around on it and told myself I could play it, which wasn't true. Mm -hmm. but I like it. And uh, eventually I became part of the whole folk music. I went to the Jewish Community Center. I was part of the folk song club. In fact, I think I co-ran it. I did at the high school. And uh, I went to summer camp a couple of weeks a year. And we learned not only Jewish songs we did, but we learned songs of the American civil rights movement and protest songs. So those were built in from a really, really young age. I must have started learning those when I was seven or eight. Wow. And uh, so it was there, you know, it was always kind of there, but it was never there as a profession that I was going to go into. And then when I started traveling, this is kind of all out of order, but it's all right. When I started traveling when I was about 20, uh, for a girlfriend wanted to go to Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, 
it was still going to be Yugoslavia for another 20 years. Um, and so we went, we bought a really cheap ticket and we hitchhiked from Italy and I heard a lot of music in the places that are now separate countries, of course, that are now Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina and Northern Macedonia and so on. I heard music I'd never heard before and I just fell in love with it totally. And then when I went back and traveled again for a whole year after my bachelor's, I was in Morocco and I was in Spain and I went back to the Balkans and I was in Turkey and I just heard all this great music and, and then friends at home introduced me to medieval music. And of course, I'm from French Canada, so I was interested in the music of the place I grew up in, French Canadian songs. And I'm Jewish, so Jewish music, and I speak English, so old English narrative ballads and so on. And But again, it didn't really occur to me to do it as a career. Right. Oh, yeah, and I played clarinet in high school. And the reason I played clarinet in high school is that it was handed to me. You're, yes. You're going to be in the band and you're going to play clarinet. What's a clarinet? This is a clarinet. So I became first clarinet, actually, and then I moved from clarinet to Baroque recorder, just because I liked the repertoire better and because it was an easier instrument to take care of and so on. So those are some of the streams that brought me here. Amazing. And, and at what point in your life did you say, OK, this is something I want to do professionally now that I've been introduced? Was it like when you were introduced when you went to travel or did you have already like a mindset of this is exactly what I want to do? I don't think I ever figured out exactly what I want to do. I still don't know exactly what I want to do, actually. And no, there was never a moment ever. I actually did a degree in English lit. Okay. And then I did a second degree in music, but mostly because I met a professor who was teaching at Concordia and I, he had an early music group and I was playing in it, you know, medieval Renaissance group. And I was playing recorder in it. And I just thought, oh, well, I should add a music degree. But because I already had a degree, I just had to do two years. Right. So I did that. And then I was teaching English and traveling and working in daycare and doing all kinds of stuff. And I was actually more interested in traveling than anything else. And then I set up a medieval women's group. Okay. I mean, not a group of medieval women, but a group for medieval music that was, well, it, it was never meant to be women, actually. It was just meant to be a group. A friend of mine that I had met ran into me on the street and said, oh, I bought a harp, an Irish folk harp this summer in Ireland. You should come over and check it out. And I said, oh, that could be really good for medieval music because I'd heard a lot in a friend's house at that point and I was experimenting, singing some medieval songs and I had got a photocopy, now it's all online, of course, but there was no online then. I had got a photocopy of 14th, 13th and 14th century uh, Catalan songs from a monastery archive up near Barcelona. I know that sounds kind of random, but <laughs> back then the only way you could do things was kind of to be there or use snail mail. And uh, we invited a third woman that I think was a friend of hers already and a fourth who was a friend of mine. And we formed a group and we had a guy in the group for a while. He was a lute player. He was really good. He just left town. And so we replaced him. And the next person to show up was a woman. And we didn't think, to, uh, we honestly were not thinking in terms of gender at all. And then someone said, oh, you have a medieval women's ensemble. And we, so we looked at each other and sort of counted each other off. And said, yeah, I guess so. It was, yeah. <laughs> and you know, we, we kind of marketed it in a way, but there was no Facebook, there was no online. If we had a concert, we did quite a lot of concerts, but the only way to announce them was to actually have a mailing list, photocopy announcements, buy envelopes and stamps and address all the envelopes and send them out. Wow. I mean, you could also phone radio stations, but that wasn't guaranteed to get a lot of play. And that was it. There was no other way to tell people. You could put posters up. But then, you know, that was a lot of time running around the city and the neighborhoods, putting posters up. We did that, too. But it was interesting because if we had had that group now, you know, it would be on social media and we'd be promoting it and you'd be asking me about it and so on. But it was yeah. a great group that went on for about 20 years. And in fact, and this brings us a bit to generations, my daughter, um, from the time she was, well, we started it long before I even thought about having children, but by the time she was five, she was actually singing with us. And she was also singing with my Moroccan Jewish Sephardic ensemble. 
and with me just by herself and very rarely in English, mostly the repertoire that we were learning. So where other kids, I mean, she went to school, she went to public school, she went to birthday parties, she, you know, heard everything that kids heard in school and parties and on the playground and at their houses and so on. But what she learned with me was actually not children's songs. I mean, there might have been the occasional one, but, you know, songs from different countries, songs in Moroccan, Ladino, Judeo-Spanish and Turkish, Judeo-Spanish and medieval Latin and and Bulgarian and Croatian and and so on. And this for her became second nature. Right. So that's so that was the the start you would say of your of just passing on everything you've learned uh through your daughter. Was it was it intentional or was it more of I want to bring her along and see if you she know what can... it was yeah it was pretty practical. I mean First of all, that's the music I did, and it's the music I listened to by choice. So that's the music that was around in the house. So it's just an osmosis factor. Yeah. And then, of course, we had a lot of rehearsals at my house, except if we were out of town. And if I was out of town, she was usually with me. So she was at a lot of rehearsals. She wasn't at the rehearsals, you know, by choice or consciously. She was just there. She might be playing with something. She might be doing homework. She might be not paying attention at all. But she absorbed a lot of it. She, I would say the, I didn't really transmit stuff to her um, deliberately. There was one song that she wanted to learn when she was really little, and I was making a recording of um, general folk music in Spain. And she sang one of the Croatian songs with me because she knew it, but she already knew it. She'd picked it up. And then I think we were sitting in the subway one day and there was a variation in Italian on an old narrative ballad. And I used to sing one voice. It was in two voices. And I used to sing one voice and play the other voice on. Do you see the instrument next to the books? Yes, the smaller one. up. No, the bigger one standing up near the books. Okay, yes. Yep. So that's a bowed instrument. It's a medieval viol. And I was playing the other melody, the other woman's voice on the viol and singing the top part. And I Remember Tamar saying to me, I think on the subway or on a bus, you know, that's not a bad song. I'd learn the other part. And I think that was the first time she actually consciously said, I want to learn this song. Yeah. And I actually officially consciously taught it to her. But most of what she's sung with me all her life, she's picked up by osmosis. Amazing. Okay. Thank you for, for bringing that up. I want to now transition into what you have learned as as you your traveler and in different communities how have you seen generations like music of generation being passed on you know i think i probably started being interested in this right at the last minute when it was still being passed on and it was kind of transitioning to not being very passed on or at least not in any traditional ways because for transmission to happen which of course it always has and often much in the way that I was telling you about by osmosis. Okay. So, I mean, just to backtrack a little bit, I remember I used to see when I first traveled in Spain, I would see more boys and girls. I mean, it was pretty gender divided still then. It isn't so much now, but I would, you know, go to a bar and they'd be these little boys, eight, nine, 10 years old, who should have been in school mm -hmm. practicing flamenco guitar. And they weren't being taught by their older brothers or fathers or neighbors or uncles they they were just being tolerated, actually. And they would, you know, sit there really, really seriously and they would be watching and they would be listening and seeing what, you know, finger technique the older men were doing and adapting it and really, really serious. I mean, they were working hard. And now and again, someone would sort of toss off at a little boy who showed a special promise, not like that, you know, like this, and then go back to what they were doing. And that's a very old form of transmission. You know, or um, there's a singing technique, a traditional singing technique in the island of Ibiza off Spain in the Mediterranean. And it, it's, um, it's a special kind of ornament you do in your voice. It's very difficult and I can't do it. Um, my daughter actually can. <laughs> but I asked a number of women how they learned it. And they all said the same thing. They all said, I listened to my mother or my aunt or my grandmother or my cousin, whatever. I listened to this older woman doing it. And I just tried it out oh, until I got it right. I heard women who play a certain kind of square drum in Spain. They don't play it with two hands. It's got a special kind of rhythm and 
you play it with one hand hitting the drum and the other hand has um like a, a a wooden beater and they're striking it and i said you know how did you learn those rhythms they're so complex and they all said the same thing they said things like well you know when i'd be walking to the fields to work in the fields i would tap the rhythms out on my thighs on my legs or i would pick up a water jug a clay water jug and try out the rhythms on that and this is women and the reason I'm saying this is women is that a lot of the time, and none of this is a rule, but it happens a lot. A lot of the time, the women had less free time. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, you know, a lot of the men, and this is like such a simplification. I don't want to make it sound like a rule, but quite often you had the men who would work very hard all day. They'd do whatever they were doing. They'd be working out in the fields. It would be agricultural work. They'd work with animals. They'd be fixing things, whatever it is they were doing. They'd work really, really hard and they'd come back. And after there was dinner, they tended to have some free time. They'd often go to bed early because they were exhausted from the work, but they'd hang out with their buddies. And if they were so disposed and if there were instruments around and there weren't always instruments around, there, there was time to practice a guitar, to practice another string instrument, to, to do that. While the women were busy doing other things with their hands, they were cooking, they were cleaning, they were nursing the baby, they were sewing, they were doing all these things. And so a lot of the women's repertoire, and again, I don't want to oversimplify, and sure, of course there are women who learned melody instruments and had the time to practice them and were brilliant at them. And of course there were men who didn't play any instruments at all and weren't interested. So I don't, you know, I don't want to make this sound as if it were like a division, but it was yeah. a pretty strong tendency. And so the women tended to spend more time learning songs from each other. I don't mean learning as in doing what I often do and memorizing a text sitting on the bus or the subway, but hearing each other often and learning and adding variations. And they also spent quite a lot of time on hand percussion instruments, mostly aimed at weddings and communal dance situations. So quite often they provide the music for dancing. They'd be singing and playing the rhythms as they, as they sang. And they weren't, some of them were fantastic, of course, at the rhythms, but most of them were just competent. They they all knew how to do it, right? And then some of them, like anything else in the world, some people sew better, some people cook better, some people sing better, whatever. So there'd be a couple of women that everyone would say, oh, go to Maria, you know, she's the best. But they were all pretty competent. It was pretty rare to find someone who just couldn't do it at all. And so they tended, I'm talking about the Mediterranean, the whole Mediterranean basis, they tended to do a lot of singing, and if they were going to play an instrument, it tended to be some kind of hand percussion. But again, that's, that isn't a rule. And as soon as gender things opened up, you know, even in the 70s, I started seeing young women in in, in uh, northwestern Spain and Galicia playing the bagpipes, which up till then had been only men, and, you know, like a lot more kind of gender role bending. Okay, interesting. I like to see the the transition that we've had from learning, just from sitting down and watching, observing, and then applying. And now it's like most people go into music class by choice. But most of these kids, as, as you're kind of highlighting, they didn't really have a choice. They just sat there and they listened. They're like, you know what, I'm going to try it out for myself. Right. And there's also what's taught in music class, which tends not to be what you're going to learn in the home. Yes. And I think what was I, I was going to, I lost a thought there. So right, transition to not learning. There was a point at which older women started saying to me, my daughter doesn't know these songs. My granddaughter isn't interested. You know, my sister's daughter doesn't want to learn them. My sister's children aren't interested. What's going to happen to these songs? And there was a point at which a lot of people started saying that to me, or if they didn't care that much, not all of them cared that much, they wouldn't say anything, but it was obvious because <laughs> over the years, you know, I would be interviewing a woman who was, say, 40 and knew a lot of songs. But then it got to the point where nobody under 70 knew them right. or nobody under 85 or they knew snatches. They could sing you a little bit, but they couldn't sing you the whole song. And what really changed was the context. So if mm -hmm. you have a wedding, it's a traditional wedding. And it lasts over several days and the preparations start weeks before. I mean, they do now too, but in a different way. So you need to, as a young girl, start preparing your trousseau, your towels and your linens and your, you know, 
everything that you're going to need as a bride in a new household and you're busy sewing and embroidering and getting ready for it, there's songs that you sing for that step. And then in some cultures, you, you display the trousseau that you've made because you're proud of it. You're proud of your sewing and your embroidery. And there's songs for that. And then your fiancé, maybe his parents come and make a special visit with certain kinds of sweets on a tray or whatever. There's songs for that. Uh, in a lot of Mediterranean cultures, and it doesn't go by religion, a lot of Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, that's not just the Mediterranean, but the Indian subcontinent, a lot of, of cultures have henna painted on the night before the wedding at least to the bride's hands, sometimes to the bride's feet, uh, sometimes to the guests and so on. And so there are a lot of songs for that, a lot of special songs for that. There's songs for the wedding celebration itself and so on and so forth. So if the context for all of these songs disappears, then most of the songs start fading away as well. And mm -hmm. then there were certain kind of work songs, you know, you had sewing bees, they didn't call them sewing bees, they didn't call them anything. They called, they said, hey, you know, you want to, come over and have tea while we sew together. <laughs> and they were songs that women would sing while they did that. And those songs didn't depend on a rhythm. So if you have songs for dancing, you want the rhythm to be there. If you have songs that are just for things that don't have a particular rhythm, you know, you're, you're sewing or you're carding wool, you're pulling knots out of the, the wool, that's this kind of thing. It could be any kind of song. And very often they would be long songs because you were in no hurry to finish singing. You were going to be working for the next few hours and there was no constraint. You know, you, uh, in the early days of the recording industry, you went into the studio and you had three minutes per song. That was it. Yeah. And it became customary to have songs that weren't much longer than that. But if you don't have any time limit, you can sing a long narrative ballad. You know, the king got up and he, you know, saddled his horse and he rode off into battle and so on. And you can keep going for 10, 15 minutes on the same song. No problem. You can sing one line and have people repeat it after you, which is a great way of learning songs. Or you can sing a whole song all the way through and then somebody can say, wait, I heard it sung differently when I was visiting my sister-in-law. Oh, really? What did they do? Well, I don't remember exactly, but I think I remember them doing this. And then, you know, radio came in and that was a different kind of transmission. People learned songs on the radio. Um, Men did military service and they were stationed somewhere else and they heard music there and heard songs there and brought it back. And sometimes their families would learn that from them as well. So there's all kinds of transmission mm -hmm. happening all the time. But, but the old school, you know, mother teaches, daughter teaches, daughter teaches, daughter teaches, daughter. Yes. That chain is pretty fragile right now. Yes, I would have to agree. And especially in our society where we live, I mean, everything's so accessible online now, right? So it, it really is by choice. I want to sit down and I want to learn some, you know, chords on the guitar. But to have somebody physically there teaching you, I, I see it less and less often all the time. And some kids honestly are just not interested in learning anymore. And it, I mean, it's work. You yeah. see that in school also. There, You know, we we memorized a lot. And I always think of it as a kind of memory muscle. We memorized a lot of poetry. And the younger I was when I was told to memorize this poetry, the more I remember it now, actually, because it's just kind of, you know, fused Great. into my <laughs> internal hard drive kind of thing. But I can't recite part of it. I can recite all of it or nothing. You know, it's like kind of press some kind of interior click and the entire poem or soliloquy or whatever it is comes out. But I can't give you the middle of it or the end of it. Right. You know, but um Paradoxically, during the pandemic lockdowns, when Zoom really proliferated, there was a lot of teaching and transmission, um, sometimes of songs, actually quite a lot of songs, um, and a lot of minority languages. So paradoxically, the um, technology during the, the lockdowns really facilitated a lot of transmission and it was very often from older generations to younger. And I'm looking at uh, the Sephardic, you know, my specialty is Sephardic music, which is music of the, the Jews who are descended from the Jews that were expelled from Catholic Spain in 1492. Mm -hmm. And they went all around the Mediterranean. They went to what are now Morocco, Greece, Turkey, 
the Balkans and they kept singing. Well, for a while they sang the same songs, obviously they would change them, but they kept singing in the old languages and they kept some of the old songs and adapted them to new tunes and so on. But the language, which people call Judeo-Spanish or Ladino or a number of other names, was really dying out as a first language, almost I mean, very few anyone who speaks it as a native language is mother tongue is, you know, is in their 70s or older now. But during the pandemic, there were already courses. There were already people setting up courses and textbooks and so on because they didn't want to see this disappear. And during the lockdowns, a lot of the older people, especially women who had um, highly educated women, but they'd grown up with their grandmothers speaking it. And so you had at least two women I can think of offhand in their 80s from Turkey, but who've lived in the United States since they were in college. They went to study in the States and they married in the United States and stayed there. But they grew up speaking both Turkish and Judeo-Spanish in in Turkey, in the city of Izmir, actually. And both of them, one lives in New York City and one lives in Texas. And they're in their 80s and they both have husbands who are more fragile physically than they are. And they don't, they used to travel a lot, both of them. And they both they're both older themselves and, you know, have some health problems, but they also have spouses who they don't like to leave for very long. And, and of course, with the lockdown, nobody was traveling anywhere. And suddenly these women were transmitting. They both learned Zoom really quickly. They went from never having heard of it to knowing all the ins and outs really, really fast, sharing PowerPoints, creating PowerPoints, uh, figuring out the best way to teach on Zoom, how far to sit from the camera, how much to use hand jet, everything, everything, everything. And suddenly these older people were transmitting their knowledge mm. using modern technology and people signed up. They had to repeat these courses two and three times during the lockdowns. And then once the lockdowns were over, some of these things continued and some people are still doing that, but that gave a huge impetus to it. So it was a really, and I did a lot of lectures and, and workshops, in fact, over Zoom. I did more than I normally do live in a year, in a given year. So that was a really interesting and I think very positive development. I mean, not that a pandemic is ever positive. You don't want anyone you know, sick or, or worse. But the te technology helping traditional transmission with generations, I thought was fascinating and exciting. Yep. And even the fact that I can go online and just learn about these traditions without actually traveling to the country itself, sometimes accessibility is a problem, right? Um, so I think that's that's also very interesting and and a good positive to all this tech that's happening. Right well, now. absolutely. Um, in fact, some of the archives of traditional song, and this has nothing to do with lockdown, are online now and archives that I had to go to physically. And, right. you know, you can't get to talk about access. You can't just pick up and buy a plane ticket, cross an ocean and spend a couple of months, you know, listening. I've done that. I had grants to do that way back when, when I was just finishing my doctorate, I had a postdoc grant to do exactly that. But you can't do that forever, you know. Yeah. And I remember poor Tamar sitting with me in the archives at the National Sound Library in Jerusalem, you know, so bored. And I just had to, they gave me permission and I had to transfer as much of this to cassette, cassette, wow. <laughs> as I po possibly could so that I could study it later on. Wow. Yeah. Even, so that's, you know, people, including me, people, and when I say people, I also mean me, forget that, you know, we forget how difficult it was to do that. And now when people say things like, oh, can you recommend, you know, a song or something to me? I said, well, um, sure, go online and look for, <laughs> and I used to have to say things like, well, can you travel, you know, can you make it to Madrid and the archive there, or you can make it to Jerusalem and the archive there, can you make it to Germany and the Berlin archives? At the very least, can you go to Bloomington, Indiana to the ethnomusicology archives? Or faute de mieux, you know, if you just want Canadian material, can you go to Ottawa and persuade them to give you a set of earphones and let you listen to some of the tapes, the real to real tapes? And now I just say, sure, click here. Yeah. Which is amazing. And and me too, you know, like I can't pick up and cross the ocean, you know, anytime I want to, obviously. So it's kind of astonishing. 
Oh no, it's amazing. It's just a click away and it opens up a whole new. So it's, it's a bit of a rabbit hole once you start listening to all these things and learning. The more you know, the more you know that you not, you don't know. Oh yeah. I mean, you never, the thing is you just don't, you don't get enough. Right? Never. Yeah. Um, can we now transition to talking about just for the last few minutes, what your biggest takeaway has been from just learning from communities and, and different cultures? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I should mention that I also teach formally. You know, I, I, I teach classes at York University and I've done that for 30 years and I've given many guest classes and taught at many guest places. I taught in Montreal. I've taught also at all levels from daycare through continuing education. So I should say that when I talk about transmission, I'm not only talking about, you know, folk style transmission. And when I'm teaching at university, I teach both things. I teach academic, you know, history, music history and, and ethnomusicology courses and so on. But I also teach practical courses. I also teach singing traditions and recorder and so on. And I've done that both in person and online. So that's a whole other kettle of fish or for example the Ukrainian collective I sing with here in Toronto sing with Ukraine we also do a combination we formally sit if we have time and teach each other songs or we go to workshops and invite someone who's a real expert or we go online and do that or we just pick it up again you know listening to each other a lot and practicing as we did yesterday at the last minute before a show so I'm involved still in all kinds of academic, non-academic, formal, informal, and so on, you know, transmission and working with all kinds of generations at the same time. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. A takeaway, I don't know. I, I don't really have one takeaway. I mean, part of me wants to say, this is terrible. I want to turn the clock back. I never want this transmission to die out. And of course, the, you know, the little cynic in me or, or realist actually in me says really and would you also rather that these women not have washing machines and have to go to the river and scrub their clothes just so they can sing all those great songs that they sang while they you know carried heavy loads of laundry on their heads to the river and got their hands all cold and, and red scrubbing clothes against the rock you really want them to do that just so they can sing those songs and transmit them and you want their daughters to do that instead of going to school really Right. You know, so I wish there was some way of maintaining these these wonderful, you know, songs and, and music techniques and so on without getting in the way of every generation, you know, being able to fulfill themselves as best they can. And, they, you know, you don't always know at eight or 10 or 12 or even 15 or 18 years old what's going to work out best for you. But you need the opportunities you need. You don't know what you don't like unless you're offered all these things you can't choose unless you have something to choose from you know so i guess if i have a takeaway i have this kind of quixotic wish that you know all children growing up had the full range of possibilities to choose from in other words not taking away anything technology is great we're sitting here using technology right this minute and as i just recounted to you it also made some of these older women able to transmit their knowledge in a way they never would have been able to. But I wish that in addition to that, they still valued everything from cursive writing. You want to be able to read your grandparents' letters to each other, you know? Everything from cursive writing to traditional singing to learning how to do things the old way, but not losing, you know, all these schoolyard games. We used to go to the schoolyard and play skipping games and sing, and I still know all the singing rhymes that we did. And some of them were just taken away because educators found them, you know, difficult problematic shall we say but as kids we never thought about that we just you know it was like tom and jerry cartoons you know you'd go to a movie and you'd see these tom and jerry cartoons and they'd be flattened and they'd get up again well it never occurred to us that you would go out and flatten somebody yeah exactly <laughs> so i just kind of wish that a lot of these old traditions were available that people that value were given by educators which it too often isn't not only to learn them, but to learn them in certain ways. So if you sing a song, and I know you only have a couple of minutes, but if you sing a song, but you sing it with a totally different vocal production and it sounds really different, you don't have the old ornaments and you add harmonies, you might have another beautiful artistic creation. You probably do have another beautiful artistic creation, which has its own value. 
But I would love people to also, not to throw anything out, but to also be able to sing or play the instrument or dance or whatever in these beautiful traditional ways. And again, not to take away from new things that people are doing, which are exciting and wonderful and more often than not really beautiful, but just to also keep the other traditions and in, at the very least enjoy listening to them and receiving them and ideally also be able to do them if you can. Yes. Thank so you. just to end there, I do things in the old way, but I do things also in a new way because I juxtapose traditions. So I might sing several versions in different languages of an old narrative ballad together, like a Yiddish version, an Italian version, a medieval version, a French version. And I'll tell the story of how this ballad developed over the years, and I'll put it together in ways that are not traditional at all. But the actual delivery of how I sing them when I do sing them as examples is traditional. And yet my daughter, who can do all this, she grew up with me, she can sing anything traditional just like that. But she's really gone in all kinds of directions and will go in more directions. And every day she does something new and exciting, either alone during the lockdown or online or with you know her own band or other, other musicians she works with. And she develops these things in all kinds of new ways. But she knows what the old ways are. Mm. And she can sing them if asked. Yes, and there's a sense of... So I can applaud her. I mean, I get really excited, not just because she's my daughter, but because she's like a super yes, good right. musician and singer and performer. And I can really applaud what she's doing and also feel happy that she does know where these traditions sprang from and, and she can call them up. And I think some of the best musicians around do that. They innovate. They do all kinds of new, exciting things both alone and in cooperation with other musicians or other artists, storytellers, dancers, theater people, or environmental activists, um, which is another important area of music. But they can also, the ones that are in my mind are among the best ones, they can also call up the roots of these traditions and how they were sung and played. Yes, it's like this collective um, sense of gratitude for everything that came before you. And now it's it's um it's coming to light through you. So I think that's very important. Thank you so much for highlighting and thank you so much for being a part of this discussion and being a part of the series. It was an honor to have you here. Any last Well, thank you so much for inviting me and I really look forward to hearing what some of the other people in the series have to say. And thanks for doing this series. It's a really exciting series full of possibilities and its own transmission and generational value. I agree. Every time I end one of these sessions, it's 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 a sense of inspirement. Like I feel inspired. I feel also empowered through these conversations. That's the best. That's the yeah. best. And I hope many other people do too. For sure. Um, is there any website or social media that people can find you at if they want to see you? Uh, my website is very simple. It's just my name, judithcohen.ca, so that I can do the chat thing, or you can just write my name.ca without even a it will be attached to the caption of the series so you can find judith Cohen. and i'm on facebook just under my name okay i can't remember what the number is attached to it but eventually you'll see a picture and you'll know that it's i okay. um i do use twitter and instagram but not very much i'm there i just don't, don't do much about it but i use facebook all the time and i answer my email really really fast Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank it you. was an honor to have you on here. And we'll catch everybody next Tuesday. Thanks so much. Take care.